to try to protect our democracy. I'm gonna frame up this issue of protecting our elections from insiders who are big lie believers, and then introduce you to our first set of two panelists who are gonna talk about the challenges of addressing mega insider threats, and then I'll do a frame on solutions and we'll hear from um, three folks as well on solutions for you all, and then we'll take your live questions. Um, so I think collectively we took most honest local election officials for granted as Americans until um, elections were designated critical infrastructure after Russia scanned more than 20 state voter databases and may have accessed one or two in 2016. And then a massive wave of harassment of Republican, Democrat, and nonpartisan election officials followed 2020. Uh, and that resulted in one in five election officials in this country leaving their jobs from aging out or leaving because they didn't want to deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. And that loss of experience is also a threat to our elections because elections are sort of like, and depending on the largest jurisdictions, it's like running 250 weddings in one day. It has to be perfect, <laughs> right? Every voter has to have their voice heard and if you screw it up, it's a big deal. Um, so that alone is a challenge. That's an insider threat in a way because you're getting less experienced folks in. They're more likely to make mistakes that could disenfranchise voters and fuel more election lies. 38% of election officials this year in May are reporting threats and harassment in a Brennan Center survey and that's up from last year. So this is not going away as probably many of you know and that's why you're here. And these threats look very different in a rural county in Oregon showing up to work as an election official and finding uh, painted in giant letters on your parking lot, vote don't work next time bullets, mm. Mm. to election officials refusing to certify the results of their own elections that they ran. These are complex and multifaceted problems. I think we have a number of solutions to talk through and we're interested in your ideas. It's clear, I just wanna say, I'm talking about MAGA Republican attacks specifically. Republican officials are being harassed heavily and losing honest election officials of any party is extremely dangerous for our democracy. Um, so our first two panelists will share more about how the ongoing attacks on our elections from the inside are playing out. Agogo Adevbi currently serves as Michigan's Deputy Secretary of State. Before Secretary Benson appointed him in March of 2023, he was the Michigan State Director of All Voting is Local, a Detroit native. Agogo has played a crucial role for more than a decade in protecting voters through his advocacy for ballot drop boxes, early voting, increased funding for clerks who run elections at the local level in Michigan, and protections for election workers. Then we'll hear from Ms. Olivia Coley Pearson, who has served as an elected official on the city of Douglas, Georgia Board of Commissioners for the past 24 years. She is the first black woman elected to city government and holds the honor of being the first black woman from the city of Douglas to serve on the Georgia Municipal Association Board of Directors. She is one of my heroes. In 2016, Ms. Cooley Pearson was wrongfully arrested and charged with improperly assisting a voter who had asked for voting assistance. And again, in 2020, while taking black voters to the polls, she was exonerated of all charges but her experiences were the subject of the Emmy Award nominated documentary, Meet the Woman Fighting for the Voting Rights of Those Who Can't Read. Let's start with a go-go. It's uh, wonderful to be with everybody here today. And, um, you know, I think about kind of my experience in this uh, election uh, space. I have spent most of the last 14 years as a volunteer working uh, every couple of years as a poll challenger, working in boiler rooms, helping to recruit lawyers to protect the, the right to vote on election day. Uh, but as I approached 2020, as I think a lot of us in this room thought, like what could I do to really ensure that we are protecting our democracy at a really critical time? And I took the job uh, at All Voting is Local. And immediately we were confronted with the unique challenge of the pandemic and how we were going to ensure that voters had that ability to have their rights heard during this once in a lifetime experience. But we are also dealing with some unique threats that we're gonna talk about today, particularly uh, with people using the poll challenger process in Michigan where people can get certificates to come into voting uh, 
spaces and challenge the eligibility of voters, challenge ballots, and challenging uh, the process, which is something that Michigan has had on the books for decades. It's a unique uh, innovation uh, in Michigan that we are really proud of, but it was abused. Uh, particularly as those of you who may remember at the central counting site in Detroit at the TCF Center, people were literally banging on the windows, trying to harass election inspectors, trying to, election, to uh, impact election workers. And so we had this new phenomenon of people trying to disrupt the process by using Michigan law to suppress the vote. But it didn't stop there because in 2022, we saw a lot of disruption more and more from the inside. Uh, the Republican National Committee deliberately took a, a stance that they were going to recruit people to be poll workers who were going to take steps to challenge voters. Uh, and so we had to respond to that. And, and then we have gone on to see in Adams Township in Michigan actual election officials. Uh, we had a clerk in Adams Township share sensitive proprietary information uh, with an election denier, and she ultimately was charged with a felony. And now we're facing efforts again for people to have access to our, our voter rolls, which are have to be secure so that we have an, an integral a voting system that is secure, that we can all have confidence in, and also people who are trying to just infiltrate the process once again. So we really have to keep on our toes and keep our minds open and clear so that we can identify these threats and continue to push back and keep our democracy open and welcome for everyone. Yes. Ms. Coley Pearson. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, let me say thanks to Netroots for having this discussion, uh, for having me as a panelist and the rest of us as a panelist, uh, because this is a very critical and crucial issue in which we are dealing with. What happens when big, the big lie is that big lie believers are, and when they are in charge of elections, not that when they might be in charge, but when they are in charge. When that happens, we have a big mess, quite honestly and quite frankly. Our entire democracy is threatened. So again, I'd like to say thanks to Netroots. I'd like to say thanks to Black Voter Matter. I'd like to say thanks to my colleague, Ms. Catherine Grant, for coming and assisting me to make this trip because I do have mobility issues. And I'd like to say thanks to CGG, Coalition of uh, Good Governance. We must ask ourselves, moving forward, sorry about that. We must ask ourselves, moving forward, do we want a democracy or do we want a dictatorship? Because if we do not begin to correct the wrongs that have been done in our society, I'm afraid we are going to end up with a dictatorship. When election deniers are in charge of elections, all manners of evil begin to happen. We are witnessing this with our very own eyes right now. And as a matter of fact, I have witnessed it and experienced it personally. In 2016, I was unjustly arrested, as Ms. Aquine stated, for merely verbally telling a first time voter how to use the voting equipment. She asked for assistance. She did not even begin voting until after I had verbally explained to her what she needed to do. And then I walked away. But however, I was arrested, indicted, and prosecuted. And when 
A 24-year-old juror was on that trial. One of the jurors, she refused to vote guilty out of 12 people. One person, 24 years old, voted not guilty. My case ended up in a hung jury. However, the district attorney stated he was going to immediately retry my case, and he did. However, I was able to obtain legal representation from Southern Center for Human Rights out of Atlanta, Georgia. They came in and they represented me. Uh, they got the first initial charges of inappropriately assisting a voter, which was not even an OCGA statute. It was not a law under Fisher Code of Georgia annotated. It was just something made up. So those got dismissed, so I ended up being tried on one case, false swearing, because I said the young lady needed help. To my knowledge, she needed help because she asked me. But anyway, we got a change of venue to another county from the county I was residing in, Coffee County, Coffee County, Georgia, which I'm sure all of you might have heard about in the news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the end, they went in and they deliberated less than 20 minutes, came back out with a not guilty verdict, okay? So, so in that case, that instance, the judicial system, it worked. And it can work when we do what's right to make sure we got people in the right place who want to do right. However, a couple of years later, while taking some people to the polls to go vote, October 2020, I was arrested again and told I could not be on the premises of the Coffee County Board of Elections. I was an elected official. We helped to pay the Coffee County Board of Elections to conduct elections, but yet they're gonna bar me from there. That case is currently being, uh, uh, I won the case when I went to trial, no, no wrongdoing. So I'm now, Southern Center for Human Rights is appealing, appealing the arrest. But I said all that to say this, we have our work to do because some of the big lie believers, they know that what they are doing is wrong. They know it's wrong, but they don't care. All they care about is getting the results in which they want. That's what they want. So providing assistance was not a, it was not a crime. It was not a crime. Uh, and the results proved that I had done nothing wrong. Our democracy as we know it is being threatened. Our freedoms are being threatened. We are at risk. We can see this with the Project 2025. We can see this by how I was arrested and on the books. I was arrested with something that was not even a statute. How can that happen? We can see that we are at, at risk by the insurrection that happened on our nation's capital of January the 6th, 2021. If we continue to sit down and not mobilize, not unite, not galvanize the future for our children and our grandchildren will no longer exist. They won't have a future. We must come together we must come together across party lines to stand for what is right. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I'm going to close it out with what finally happened in Coffee County where we had some Republican people that came in to our Coffee County Board of Elections office, and they stole all of our voting information. There was the biggest breach in our country where the big lie believers allowed Republican people to come to Coffee County, Georgia, copy all of our data. What they've done with it, only God knows. We did not give them authority to get it. The Election supervisor, then Mr. Hampton, same lady who had me prosecuted 
for helping people to vote, same lady, was actually indicted by DA Fonnie Willis out of Atlanta, Georgia. Kudos to, kudos to Miss Fonnie Willis. But it's ironic to me, very ironic, that although thousands of dollars were spent to prosecute me for just providing mere assistance, verbal assistance to a first time voter, but no monies have gone to, no monies have gone to investigate Mr. Hampton and her cohorts for allowing people to come in to the Coffee County Board of Elections and steal our voting data. The district attorney has not investigated it. Our Georgia Secretary of State has not investigated. No local law enforcement agency has investigated this. But yet they chose to attack someone, one person, me, for assisting a voter who asked for it. So our entire state, not just, not just Georgia, but our entire country, we are actually at risk. We are at risk and we must decide First of all, what are we going to do? Like I stated already, we must come together. We must unite and fight back. Citizens must become engaged in their local boards of elections to be involved in what's happening uh, in Coffee County. Uh, several of us have came together and we are working together as voters and residents where we have attended every board of elections meeting. We've uh, lobbied for increased transparency we work to educate the public with multiple town hall meetings. We talk with media every chance we get to fight for and find a resolution. Because we are not safe. We are threatened. And this is very serious. And it's sad to say a lot of people are not even aware of the big threat that we are facing. Our work is making a difference because currently we are to the point of obtaining a legal investigation into what occurred. That's where we are, but we can't stop there. We need to be galvanized with people from all across the United States saying what happened in Coffee County and any other areas is wrong and we are not going to stand for it. Something to do with cybersecurity, uh, you know, we had Forensic experts to look into it that it's easy to manipulate uh, voting equipment, the current voting equipment that Coffee County uses. And I was told that the other states, some of them that's on this panel, they have a more advanced system that's so, not so easily uh, attacked. So that's what we need also in the state of Georgia. But we need everybody to come together to work with us. I need you all to, to Google. If you don't want to take my word, just Google. Google my name, Olivia Coley Pearson, Commissioner Olivia Coley Pearson, and you can find my story. What happened to me was nominated for an Emmy Award for the work that I do and the work that I'm going to continue to do. But we need help of other states, other counties all across the United States because we cannot afford, we cannot afford to allow our democracy to be taken away from her, us. We have worked too hard and too long for where we have come from. Thank you. When I look at you and hear what you have to say, Ms. Olivia, just relentless. <laughs> you are relentless and I'm sure it is tiring and we cannot let you or anyone do this work alone. We have to step up and support you even as we're tired in our own fights. And this is true for many, many election officials who are doing the right thing. Um, and there's lots of counties in Georgia that don't have uh, Miss Olivia doing the fight and who have been swept. Anybody who's willing to stand up has been swept because there aren't enough people to stand up. So. Um, really appreciate you both and what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Just wanted to point out, it's implied, but insider threats obviously to elections are not new. There's racist and partisan uh, insider threats to elections that we've been battling for many years. I think what's new about the MAGA threat is that they're willing to throw the entire election out. It's not just about keeping certain people from voting. If they don't get what they want, 
they don't care about certifying any election, what? anybody's vote, right? Um, so the problems are serious and there are solutions and I'm excited we have more solutions in addition to being relentless, which is absolutely the number one. Um, there are legislative, legal, and nonpartisan political solutions to this problem and I have a sign-in sheet. Uh, I hope folks can sign that if you'd like to get some of the resources that I'm going to talk about. Public Citizen has a tracker of the I think around 30 states that have protections for election workers. Some of those states that you'll hear about have protection for voting systems as well because unfortunately in the jurisdictions where voting system data, the software copies have been distributed and not returned and that is an election security threat as well. One that we hope checks and balances can mitigate but one that shouldn't be there. Um, so we can physically and legally protect voting text from hacks, malware and errors as well as officials and voters from attack. And we can offer support, like we talked about. We can prosecute insiders. Um, you know, Missy Hampton in Covey County, but also the chair of the GOP was involved with that breach in that county. She's also been charged. Right. Um, and then project the intent. Law enforcement can project the intent that they will prosecute because some folks are doing their research before the attack these election officials and we want to make sure they know that what they're planning to do is illegal. And then people power. Um, thank Election Heroes Day is something that us and our allies have pursued just to make sure that election officials who are doing the right things don't feel alone, don't leave, don't step aside under political pressure. So attending county council meetings, asking your local election officials how you can best support them if they are good and then being relentless when they're not. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Representative Emma Greenman, again from Deputy Secretary Adevbi, and from Sam Leibert about local solutions. So let me introduce our two new speakers. Uh, Representative Emma Greenman is representing South Minneapolis, District 63B in the Minnesota House. We got some fans. <laughs> Minneapolis? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Nice. <laughs> Um, she's a voting rights lawyer with over 15 years of experience working on democracy and justice issues as an attorney, a policy expert, and advocate in the Minnesota legislature. She is the chief author, author of the sweeping Democracy for the People Act, the Minnesota Voting Rights Act, probably the most significant large piece of democracy legislation passed across the country in the last couple of years. So I just have to Ooh. congratulate you on that. <clears throat> Before being in the legislature, she was with the Center for Popular Democracies National Voting Rights and Democracy Program. I'll introduce Sam, and then we'll hear from them both. Um, finally, Sam Leibert will talk about local solutions. He is the Wisconsin State Director for All Voting is Local, a role in which he passionately advocates for voting rights and accessibility. Previously, Sam was the clerk treasurer, which is the main election official, among other things, for the village of Shorewood Hills, Wisconsin, and had a similar position in Sussex and the city of Monroe. And he also served three terms on the Janesville City Council as an at-large member, concluding his service as city council president. We'll start with Representative Greenman. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, South Minneapolis in the back. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I am really grateful to be here with all of you. Um, and I know uh, from many of you in the audience have been working on this uh, for years. And I just wanted to sort of um, pick up where Commissioner uh, Coley Pearson left off, which is um, what this ultimately about is, a, is about is about undermining faith in our democracy, undermining faith in the people um, uh, to choose our elected leaders, and undermining uh, uh, faith in the people, the, in many cases, um, anonymous, hardworking uh, uh, people in every state, in every county, in every city in the country that are just working to make sure uh, that our elections are administered freely and fairly. And so when we think about uh, what this is about, I think sometimes when we uh, talk about elections administrator administration. It's, it doesn't feel as sexy as, you know, when we pass the Voting Rights Act and when we uh, talk about the amazing sort of automatic voter registration and expanding the franchise. But without people, without faith that every vote that's cast will be counted, that that count will be reported fairly, that elections will be certified, without that, 
nothing else matters. And so when we look at all of these threats that we're talking about and we heard about um, undermining faith, uh, intimidating and harassing those folks who are, um, who are administering the, the process, who are registering voters, uh, we've seen a lot of that. Um, and, um, and looking at uh, both the, inf the physical infrastructure, the data infrastructure, um, and also um, uh, trying to influence elections, officials, elected officials, um, which is where I want to start. Because I think in Minnesota, what we saw, right, there's a lot of like, we have the highest voter turnout in the country. Um, before I was in office, I spent some time um, in Georgia, in Arizona, in Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of times, and for folks in blue states, there's a lot of Minnesotans who are sort of like, we got this. They ask me a lot of questions about what's happening in Georgia, what's happening in Texas, what's happening in Pennsylvania, but not in our backyard. And what we saw in 2020, and again, even more so in 2022, was the right-wing fueled organizing that was basically on a road show going around county by county, Rick Weibel, um, who was training, activating folks to go to county commissions places, to get them to change the election in a way that state law didn't allow them to, to put so much pressure that one county um, in 2020, late 2021, sent the Secretary of State a notice asking to decertify the 2020 election, which is not lawful. Um, and they were so, the county was so sort of wrapped up in it, they did it. And so this is the, the organizing that's happening at the local level. And when we think about solutions, I think that that's where it has to start first, which is we need to make sure that there are uh, folks organizing on the ground in every county in the country, um, in every county in the city. When I think about the work that, that We Choose Us Coalition is doing, they have been looking at and educating, right? Lots of people don't know in Minnesota, our elections are administered locally, um, and people don't know of relationships. I see um, Nse Ufa here, and I think about what the New Georgia Project did with the Peanut Gallery, which is creating an, a mechanism that there are eyes and ears on the ground in counties to actually watch what's happening. Um, and I think sometimes it's accountability, but also sometimes it's supporting those men and women who are just trying to do their jobs. And there are Democrats and Republicans, I've talked to a lot of Republican elections administrators who are also facing the same kind of vitriol and threat because they're just doing their job. And I think about Wisconsin uh, and some of the stories coming out of there. Um, Recruitment is also a thing. Again, I think like I come out of the organizing world and so I spend a lot of time recruiting folks to go knock on doors to talk about candidates or issues, but recruiting election workers, recruiting folks and supporting them, uh, training them uh, not to be advocates in the polling place, but to just be a, a fierce advocate for that voter to be able to vote whoever they choose and have that ballot be counted. And then I, I'll just talk a little bit about our policy. Um, and I could talk about policy all day and all night, but I actually think that without the, the uh, organizing, without the education, policy um, uh, isn't either well implemented or doesn't stick. Um, so I wanted to start with education and organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so we in Minnesota did a, learn from a bunch of states. And I'd say as a voting rights lawyer, I've been doing this for 20 years, but I actually was pretty unfamiliar with a lot of where you all um, have spent most of your time um, in the deep weeds of elections administration, elections infrastructure until 2020. Um, and then I got real educated, um, but we looked, we, we passed a, a new criminal law that made it a crime to interfere with machines, with the process, with elections administrators, to ta uh, tampering and unauthorized access, all of those pieces that had sort of been assumed, right, uh, but actually wasn't in law, both in the civil or criminal context. So we wanted to make sure that there was a law enforcement angle if inside, if, if election workers tried to get access to a voting machine, tried to get access to an unauthorized area, they shouldn't. Um, data, and, and I know lots of Secretary of States have actually been very focused, it's not my area, but we have done a ton on election uh, cybersecurity, uh, working with both the feds and states around the country um, the state voting, uh, um, this SVRS, the state voter registration um, uh, uh, um, uh, ballot uh, or, or a list, um, we had to pass new laws to say you can't, after actually we got some unauthorized access happening, uh, you can't do that, you can't tamper with that. Uh, we looked at harassment and interference with election workers. Mm -hmm. um, and this again, I talked to uh, amazing election workers in Minnesota who, and, and they did, their organization did a survey about what they were 
whether they were facing threats, what they were um, hearing, because what we'd hear from my Republican colleagues is, yeah, 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 that might be happening in Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, but that doesn't happen in Minnesota. And when we asked those election administrators who in, ma in many cases are half their, their job is like a third elections, a third tax collection, a third like assessment, um, they are just trying to do their jobs, had not used to be, been used to having the, the spotlight on them, and they told us they're getting they're, they're afraid of their safety, they're afraid of their information, so we passed uh, um, laws uh, making it a crime to dox election workers and their families, um, making it a crime to get in the way of them being able to perform their duties, to, to follow them into unauthorized um, uh, spaces, and to knowingly make accusations uh, with the intent to interfere uh, with, with the process. We passed laws about counting, um, obstructing access, tampering with ballot boxes, and something that will, I think when we first said this, we're like, do we even need to do this? But that the, um, that the, election, the state board of elections will certify the result of the person who gets the most votes. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after what we saw in 2021 and 2022, and we saw a lot of states and, and um, uh, where we had boards of elections rejecting um, certification, we thought that that was really important. The other thing we did this year was looked at the presidential electors uh, process, as we have seen um, with the fake board of electors, ele uh, um, uh, uh, the fake, fake slate of electors. Um, looking at both um, where they meet and making sure that we had alternatives. Again, um, for folks, even for folks in states who do not, uh, you know, if you're Massachusetts or California, you gotta look at your laws because we didn't have a law about what happens if electors can't meet in the state capitol, which the law currently says they have to, right? Mm -hmm. If there is obstruction. So we had to, to look at that. And then um, this I think is really, really important because this is probably the least sexy thing, but when our elections infrastructure is administered locally, we need to treat it like any road, any bridge, any piece of public uh, um, administration, which is we need to fund it. Right. We need to invest in it. We need to invest in the people, yeah. right? This is a professional job. We mm -hmm. need to invest in the election workers who join us for a day or a week or, mm -hmm. or and pay them. And we need to make sure that our local elections administrators, I, I, I'm picking on NSA because I didn't know she'd be here. But I know when I was in Georgia with, with her in, in 2018, you know, we had a polling place where it was shut down because they didn't bring a power cord and, and, and um, machines that shut down because they were too old. Wow. Like that is intentional. Yes. It is negligence, but it is intentional negligence. And so when we think about what we invest in, like we actually have to write the checks. And in Minnesota, for the first time ever, <laughs> we added a permanent base funding for elections administration. It is not enough, That's and great. I say that yes. Wonderful. to my Minnesota elections folks out there. We have made a commitment. Every year we want to add to that, but that is the last piece of we can't, we should not just deal with this defensively, we should deal with it offensively, which says, and then the last thing I will say, and I say this particularly out there to my um, elected officials, to the folks of the public voice, um, part of the reason that our election workers are under threat is because some of my colleagues across the aisle, the mega Republicans, have made them a target. Mm -hmm. When you have a big lie about an election being stolen and you don't have any evidence, right. the people administering the elections get blamed. And that is responsibility that we need to put and people need to stop it. Right both Republicans and Democrats, and what we need to do is lift up the heroic work mm -hmm. um, of folks uh, sitting next to me and also the nameless, faceless folks across the country. And that, I think, that piece of it we can all do, but is really, really important because um, that vitriol is creating both uh, a misuse, lawless misuse of criminal prosecution, mm -hmm. but it's also creating real physical safety threats. And so we can stop it, and, and it's us in this room and across the country. Yes. That's so thank right. You. Wonderful. Yes. yes. We'll hear briefly from Deputy Secretary Dev B and then Sam. I'm just so excited by all the things you're doing in Minnesota. I'm, I'm jealous because uh, <laughs> you guys passed the Voting Rights Act and we're still trying to pass the Voting Rights Act in Michigan, uh, but we're gonna get there. Uh, but you know, one of the things that you touched on is all the disruption that heads into an election and how it's purposeful. I mean, there is a design to create chaos 
-hmm. so that there's a pretext to deny people the right to vote and deny the certification of election results. And that's what we saw in Michigan. It was a very deliberative step-by-step -step process of sending poll challengers into uh, AV counting boards, uh, those absentee counting boards, disrupting that process, and then giving county canvassing boards who are charged with certifying the elections in each county in Michigan the pretext to deny certification. And we almost got to that point uh, in Michigan, in Wayne County, where we had two, uh, so in each county in Michigan, there are two, uh, there are four uh, canvassers, two Democrats and two Republicans. And our two Republicans in Wayne County in 2020 initially said that they would not certify. So you have your ultimate crisis situation. And fortunately, we got through it. But one of the things that we did in response to that is we passed a, a new amendment to the Constitution called Proposal 2, which clearly states that it is a duty for each canvasser to simply certify the vote based on how many votes are there. They're not an investigatory body. They're not there to kind of check the books and check the process of how well the, the clerks are doing their jobs. They're just there to count the votes certify it and ensure that the person who won the election actually takes office. So that's something that 60% of our voters in the constitutional amendment vote stood behind. So this is a bipartisan solution because ultimately when you look at the solutions and the issues, I think there's more that unites us than that divides us. Right. Yeah. But we also know at the same time that sometimes when things go wrong, people have to be held accountable. Right. And fortunately, we have a really strong attorney general in Michigan, Dana Nessel, who has gone after these people who are doing wrong right. and making sure that they're held accountable, that they're charged with felonies, and that those people are not in a position to cause more harm. Mm -hmm. So we're really proud of, of though, that us working together on the advocacy side with our attorney general and with others to ensure that we're taking steps forward. But we also know legislatively there's, there's more that we need to do. Uh, and so the Secretary of State's office has worked really hard to put in place a manual for poll challengers to ensure that what they are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do is extremely clear to everyone, both on the poll challenger side, but also with the, the local clerks all across the state of Michigan. We have 1,600 clerks. So it's extremely uh, important that we have clear guidelines for everyone. But that has come under attack. Mm -hmm. There are people who are suing our department uh, to try and strike down this very reasonable poll challenger guidance. So we are going the legislative route to try and put this into law so that eventually there is really no doubt that this is going to stand uh, the test of time. We're also really working hard on the other side of now we're seeing people using Michigan law to try and challenge whether people are actually eligible to vote. And so we have uh, a lot of communication coming from our office to our clerks to ensure that they're following the appropriate protocols when challenges come in and that they're not simply being intimidated because they think it is the goal of some of these folks to intimidate their local clerks into doing what they want rather than following uh, the rules. We have worked really hard in Michigan to put in place a lot of trainings uh, for over 600 poll workers, uh, election workers, and law enforcement figures to ensure that they are ready for all the disruptions that are coming. This, it's important that people not kind of take a step back and relax because we got through it in 2020 mm -hmm. and we got through it in 2022. Mm -hmm. We are still under threat. There yes. are still people out there who want to tear down our democracy. Yes. And it's important that we not fall asleep on that. Right. Just because we survived it once doesn't mean that we're not, we've passed that threat. Right. We are absolutely in the position, I think, in Michigan to not only survive but thrive, but that takes work. And so we are really happy that we've worked with our legislature to secure now $40 million to properly fund our elections over these last two years. And we are continuing to get money from the federal government to 
ensure that our security systems are up and running and that we are you know, striving ahead. Um, but you know, this takes all of us, and I just really think that we, uh, we have to keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Sam Leibert. Great, thank you. Um, so being from Wisconsin, it's really hard to say I wish I was like Michigan and Minnesota. <laughs> so, there, it's out, it's on the public. <laughs> Hardest part is over, um, but no, it's, um, it's thank you, thank you again for uh, allowing me to be here. Um, again, I'm with All Voting is Local in Wisconsin, and um, hearing what other folks on this panel are talking about, I mean, the same things are happening in Wisconsin, um, except we're in a, a little bit different situation politically. Uh, we have divided government, we have a, a Democratic governor, and we have an extremely partisan, gerrymandered uh, legislature which luckily a few months ago our new Supreme Court uh, struck it down and, and we now have new maps for November. So we are very excited, yes, um, very excited to, to have hopefully a more purplish legislature uh, come January of next year. Um, but you know this legislature has blocked a lot of common uh, sense things that other states are working on. We've tried to pass a statewide law that would increase protections and create a special category protecting election workers. Uh, we tried passing a bill that would have allowed clerks to begin counting absentee ballots the day before election day uh, because one big complaint, especially of MAGA and extremists and election deniers, is big cities like Madison, Milwaukee, uh, all late night they get these big dumps of votes out of nowhere and, you know, it it helps their candidates somehow, uh, yet they're the ones who killed the bill uh, to allow them that authority. Again, sort of setting up that, you know, uh, pre preempting their own arguments come election night. Um, and we also couldn't get across the line uh, to get Wisconsin into alignment with the new Electoral Count Reform Act. And so mm -hmm. Wisconsin is now one of the very few states remaining that, um, you know, our, our state laws are the ones that we follow and Wisconsin could theoretically our, our 10 electoral votes might not count. And so uh, that's something else that uh, we, we worry about. But some of the things that we're doing at the local level, um, you know, we also have a similar system, I think, to, uh, to Michigan. We've, in Wisconsin, we have 1,850 clerks. Um, so for every single municipality, whether you're a city uh, like Milwaukee with hundreds of thousands of people or you're a small township with 48 people, um, every municipality has a clerk or chief elections person that runs our elections locally. So we have a very siloed, sort of uh, broken down um, uh, system, which in, in a lot of ways has its cons, but it's also proven to be very effective against things like, uh, you know, voter uh, uh, election sabotage and different things because our local clerks are the ones who are empowered to run the elections. It's not as centralized. And so um, at the local level, we've really been working with mayors and, and town boards um, and village boards on passing local ordinances through our home rule laws to pass ordinances to increase protections uh, to our, our election workers from being intimidated, from being harassed, from being assaulted. Um, I'm actually one of those um, clerks who after uh, the 2020 and 2022 elections, um, uh, that's why I left the career. Um, after the 2020 election, um, I was harassed, my family received threats, um, I required police protection for several months after the 2020 election, um, I had to buy a home security system, my staff and I had to be walked out to our car by the local sheriff's department, um, and so these are real, real people, and we're, we're just trying to do our jobs. And, mm -hmm. Um, and so in Wisconsin, we actually have about a 25% turnover rate. So essentially with this coming election in November, almost every clerk um, is different. And so we have, we've had a huge brain drain. Our clerks are either going to different communities or going to other states or they're retiring early and, and, and going in a completely different direction career-wise. And so um, again, to what the representative said, we really need to do more to fund these positions, to uh, make the profession more respected, to support it, continuing education, and really give them the tools that they need. Um, I will talk really quickly about how, though, the checks and balances work when you have insiders trying to sabotage the system or, or try to make a point. Um, in 2022, in the midterm election in Milwaukee, the deputy elections um, executive dire director um, fraudulently requested three um, military absentee ballots and had them mailed to the ranking uh, Republican in our, in our assembly, which is like our House of Reps in Wisconsin, uh, who, was, who was an election denier. Um, and she said that she, she, she did this to, to make a point to show how weak the system is that anyone could commit fraud. Um, and 
that's not the way you do it. <laughs> uh, and so actually this, this past March, um, the former deputy director, um, she, was, uh, she was found guilty on all charges of one felony and three misdemeanors of abusing uh, an office as an election official. Mm -hmm. And she was held accountable. She was fired immediately um, back in 2022. She was held accountable. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and since then, uh, you know, we've really cleaned house, not just in Milwaukee, but also statewide. Um, in Wisconsin, we don't have a Secretary of State. Um, we, have a, we have what's called the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and we have three Republicans and three Democrats. And they oversee the nonpartisan staff who hire an executive director, and they essentially provide guidance then to our 1,850 clerks. Um, for the most part, they play well together in the sandbox, um, but another issue where you have, right, a big lie believer running elections, one of those six deniers, or one of the six election commissioners uh, is a fake elector, one of the 10 fake electors from Wisconsin. Wow. Um, there is no accountability to this guy. He is appointed by our Senate Majority Leader, uh, who's a Republican. Um, so either he is fired by the Senate Majority Leader, or he leaves on his own uh, volition. Um, he's also really active in, his Rep in the Republican Party, this fake elector. His name is Bob Spindell. Um, after the 2022 election, which you may have uh, seen was a very close U.S. Senate race between Ron Johnson and the, the former Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, um, uh, Mr. Spindell, an email was leaked that, that showed him bragging that the Republican Party could be especially proud that 37,000 fewer black and brown voters in Milwaukee turned out over the 2018 midterm election, helping us win the Senate seat. So not only do we have someone who says racist things and who attempted to overthrow the 2020 elections, he is one sixth of our election administration Jesus. power in Wisconsin. And so that's another issue that we fight against. Um, and thankfully, the other two Republicans and the three Democrats are, are, are pretty reasonable and play well together. So um, there's a lot of issues going on in Wisconsin, uh, similar to what's going on around the country. But I definitely want to hear from folks. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But I just want to say thank you for being here. I echo everything that was set up here. Um, you know, I, I, I used to work in Democratic politics. Now I'm in nonpartisan. But I will say that I am optimistically, um, I guess I am optimistic that there, you know, we need to work across lines. I'm working, I've never worked with so many Republicans in my life um, th than when I came to this job. I'm working with a former Republican governor, former Republican lieutenant governor, former Republican uh, state senator who chaired the elections uh, committee in the Wisconsin Senate for many years. Um, and there are people who want to, to save our republic. They want to uh, return to the norms that we, we, we were so used to and that we all were raised with, right, in America. And so um, this isn't just a democratic or progressive issue. We also need, uh, you know, conservatives and Republicans as well, and um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, we are ready for questions, but while I think Stan's going to come up and run the mic, if he's here, um, I just want to toot Sam's horn one more time because because our state legislature. I'm also from Wisconsin. Um, no, upper Midwest conspiracy. <laughs> um, because the state legislature did not pass the kind of protections that you saw in Minnesota for voting systems, um, all voting is local and others are working to pass those protections at the local level. And the very community that we passed in first to protect voting systems had to call the police and kick people out just last week um, for harassing election officials, basically, in a, in a special wow. election. Stan. Stan. <laughs> <laughs> love to take your questions. Yeah. This bright, bright lights. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Sue Dorfman. I'm a photojournalist that's probably covered about 46,000 miles going and photographing elections. I photographed in Georgia, in Wisconsin, in Michigan and in um, one of the other states that you guys represent. Um, the first thing is a plea to all states to have very, very clear rules for media about access to whether you have access inside the polling place when people vote, whether you have access to the ballot count. Some states allow access for everything. Some states are very restricted so that that is a way that if media is allowed into polling places, it's allowed into meetings, it's allowed into the ballot counts, 
it helps inform citizens about what is actually going on rather than making it be a hidden process. So that's a very strong plea that I have. The second thing that I want to say is I do have a photo of Kimberly Atkin, I think her name is, actually receiving ballots um, at one of the polling places in, in Wisconsin. Um, the question that I have for all of you is I keep hearing about the threats to election officials. What I am not hearing is about efforts to recruit no, more people to work at the polling places. One of the things I was told by an election head in Ohio was that, yeah, they have election deniers coming in, and after they go through the training, after they figure out the processes, is they realize that it can't be corrupted in the way that they have been told that's been corrupted. So I'm wondering if you could address what your recruitment efforts are. Yeah, um, so we do have in Michigan some pretty cool uh, clear rules on media access. Uh, everyone's allowed into a polling location. You're allowed into our AV counting boards, our absentee counting boards. But what is really crucial is that you can't pan your camera or take pictures of people in the act of voting. So that if you want to take any images, you have to do it from like the waist down so that it's not showing a voter and they can be identified. Because for some people, Voting is still kind of controversial even within their own social circles. It puts additional pressure on them. So we want to give people space to actually be able to, to cast their votes. Uh, so that's, that's one. In terms of recruitment efforts, we have a website in Michigan called michigan.gov slash democracy MVP. And anyone from across the state of Michigan can go onto that website, sign up, and indicate their interest to be a poll worker. And we, we have had, you know, we have a rule in Michigan that at each precinct across our state, there has to be at least three election workers. And within that, there has to be at least one Democrat and one Republican. It provides balance. It also provides a lot of insight for both major political parties into what is actually happening around the state. And for a while, especially before 2020, in areas of the state that were heavily Republican, all three were Republican. Mm -hmm. And places that were heavily Democratic, all three were Democrats. Mm -hmm. And that's not really healthy. No, mm -hmm. it's not. But now because of Democracy MVP and the efforts of Secretary Benson and our whole entire team, we now have clerks who can reach out to our department and say, I need help recruiting Democrats. I need help re recruiting Republicans and they get the names from our database, they recruit these folks, and so now it's not really an issue anywhere in Michigan to have that partisan balance because we provide them with that support. And we have dramatically, I think, increased the number of people who are involved in the electoral process. It, it, it really gives a lot of people, because people can't have doubts. I think election administration is very complicated. It's complex, and it has to be because it's not a straightforward process. People think it is, but it's not. But once you get involved, you can see why those steps are in place, and it really uh, you know, takes away some of the, the nuance and uh, I think mystery that people often take advantage of and try and introduce uh, disinformation and misinformation into the, the public atmosphere. And just to say a little bit more about recruitment, because I think it is a, it's a really good point. And even before all of this, we have been, like the idea of um, election worker recruitment has been really, really important, particularly bringing in more young folks. I mean, even before 2020, when you, when I went to my polling place, I think the average age in Minnesota of election workers was in their 60s. Um, and so this has been an issue, a long-term issue that, um, that we've been working on in Minnesota that our Secretary of State Simon has been working on. One of the things we have been really focused on is recruiting that next generation of, of people. Um, we have a, a program where um, 16 and 17 year olds uh, can um, can be an election worker and the other thing that that does and another piece of this is making sure that um, we have the language skills when we look at um, our, our um, 
areas uh, in the state that are high uh, multilingual. It's usually younger uh, folks and, and that, that are uh, multilingual and can provide that. Um, and so we have a, a set of both recruitment um, and, and education pieces. And then we have also been looking at um, the pay. And the last thing I will say is I do think that there has been, right, not all of this is about policy. A lot of this is about organizations like All Voting is Local, organizations like the League of Women Voters, like you name it, folks who have bases actually going out and educating and recruiting election workers and bringing them into the process. I think a good training and a good set of policies is, is really important, but without the relational touch, without uh, recruiting those folks in, um, it won't work. So uh, organizing is important. And I like to add, in Georgia, especially in Coffee County, Georgia, and, and Coffee County is a rural community. Most people who are not familiar with Georgia, they think, when they hear Georgia, they think automatically of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm 250 miles south of Atlanta in a small community. Douglas is 11,000 people, the whole county is about 40,000. And what happens there in Coffee County is the Coffee County Board of Commissioners each appoint one board member to the Board of Elections, okay? County Commission is five members, so they can appoint five people. So the, the, the Board of Elections consists of five people. However, four of those county commissioners are Republican. One is a Democrat. So that's a problem. I think that we should have federal legislation that dictates what type of individuals, party, whatever, is appointed to the local boards of elections mm -hmm. to be more fair, to be equitable. We're yeah. going to have to have some type of intervention, in my opinion, from the federal level yeah. to make sure that it's more fair. Yeah, and public citizen, I know other, other groups in the space support sweeping democracy reform, including the mm -hmm. Freedom to Vote Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and, and probably more at this point as things continue to erode. I saw a question here. Maybe we can take two quick questions, one after the other, and then we're, we're going to be at time. So um, this gentleman had his hand up uh, first, and then you'll have to pick one of the other two. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the question of um, voter eligibility. Um, because I'm from Georgia, but I went to law school in Texas. Back um, previously when I had voted, I was voting in Georgia. When I moved to uh, Texas, got my driver's license. Um, I registered at the same time. However, when 2016 came around, for some reason, they didn't have my registration. So I had to take a quick trip back to Atlanta to vote. Mm -hmm. And when I got back after the election, my registration to vote was there. But that mm -hmm. same year, a young lady named Christine Johnson uh, ended up being prosecuted by the state because the question of voter eligibility. She just got, uh, just you know, made it through that case just maybe two months ago. But I, I sit on the board uh, for uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Dallas and we were you know, serious advocates about that because we see that happening over and over and over again. Uh, and, and there's no real process, no clear process outside of a legal rem uh, remedy that you can actually challenge that. So I'm just curious to know what y'all thoughts are about voter eligibility. Just take one more question, because we're basically at time, and then we'll answer both and wrap. Um, sorry, I don't know which one of you. You still have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Judith Brown, Diana's Advancement Project. Um, so we do voter protection and work around election administration for years now. Um, we just wanted to ask about what you see as, like, if you were saying, like, here's the top three like concerns because what we're seeing is challenges to voter eligibility um, and like places like Georgia was going to be mass challenges, Virginia is the same. Um, we're also seeing the use of AI, Eagle AI um, as disinformation to remove people from the rolls. Um, and then the certification issues, we're really concerned about that but would love to hear from you all what you think. Like I always tell my team think like somebody who wants to steal an election and let's figure out what that is, but we're not creative enough, I think, to steal an election, so we'd love to hear from you all what you're seeing. Um, I, I could say quickly, I think for Wisconsin, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think certification 
uh, is uh, a big issue. We've got 72 counties. Um, in every county, um, the county clerk is automatically on the board of certification, and then each party has a representative. So there's three um, of most of our 72 counties. Most of them are Republican. Um, so that is a concern that if you have a, a clerk who's been sort of co-opted with a party appointee, they could stop it. Um, but also cha mass challenges to um, not only just um, someone's ability to vote um, or cast a ballot, but also challenging absentee ballots uh, is huge. In Wisconsin, our, our Supreme Court just brought back drop boxes, and so that's sort of the next fight, is worrying about armed militia, uh, people taking pictures of folks dropping off ballots, um, and, and how that'll be uh, sort of litigated um, in the courts. I'd like to quickly add uh, to what Sam just said. I agree with all of that, but also in Georgia, we have something that was recently passed called Senate Bill 202. Senate Bill 202 is a reenactment of Jim Crow mm. because where we could in the past, anybody could go and carry someone an application for an absentee ballot and or assist the person. They've made it uh, a criminal act now. If you are not a uh, immediate relative to that person that's needing assistance with that absentee ballot, you know, an elderly person who might be confined to their home, you, you've got to be related to them to assist them in getting the absentee ballot completed. Uh, certification, as you mentioned, sir, all of this is just a, a means of voter suppression. We just got to lay it on the line, and we've got to organize ourselves, as I keep saying, to fight those tactics. We've got to talk to our state representative, talk to whomever we can talk to in elected positions to get some changes made. It's my understanding that Senate Bill 202 is, been, is being challenged currently by a couple of organizations, and but that's what we've got to push for. We've got to get that change because this is a legal way to keep voters suppressed, keep numbers down. Our Secretary of State, he has purged many black voters from the list unjustly. We have a lot of issues going on, but it's gonna take all of us, all of us coming together, working together to fight this because it's just not right. That's the bottom line. It's not right. Mm -hmm. And either you stand for something or you fall for anything. What she said. <laughs> um, and I think to the eligibility point, you know, the, the, the missing link here is what we need, we actually need federal yeah. uh, voter protection legislation yes. that, that creates universal suffrage, right, and protects eligibility. Because mm -hmm. the story you told of Georgia to Texas uh, or wherever, right, every state has different eligibility, different registration rules. Many states, both of the states you mentioned, um, are, are intended to be barriers, right, not bridges to, to, to participation. And so um, even the, the most educated, most proactive voter will get caught up into the morass of rules um, to make it really, really Really hard, and so we need federal uh, rules because it shouldn't be that because you're in Minnesota it's easier to vote than because than, than when you're in Georgia. And so I, I I don't know we have to do what we do at our state, mm -hmm. and we need to protect. But I think we all sort of need to be in the business of ensuring that you know American democracy only will survive and thrive if every person in the country who's eligible to vote can vote, wants to vote and feels that power and then have their, their vote uh, uh, cast and counted. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'd say, and I think I, just to the question of like what else, um, I think we have got a pretty good list. I think I just wanna uh, uh, re-up what Sam says, which is I think uh, a violence at the polls, mm -hmm. um, which is something I think we, we spent a lot of time talking about in 2020. Um, we saw some uh, um, action happen in Minnesota where they were gonna put armed guards in the polls right after um, uh, uh, George Floyd was murdered and, and the uprising that election. Um, and it didn't come to fruition, but I think uh, the last three years, four years, there's been a lot of planning and a lot of malicious um, organizing. And so I do think we need to, to think uh, more strategically about how we're gonna handle uh, violence at the polls in both places where uh, law enforcement can be an asset and in places, frankly, where we're worried that law enforcement might be part of the problem. Um, both of those things I think we need to, to think about. Um, and um, as you put your, your thinking cap on with the amazing folks at the Advancement Project and others, um, my sense is, is that's sort of something to add to the list. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
So I, I do actually think you have all three there. I think disinformation is huge, and the way we combat that is we've got to get the facts out ahead of time so that disinformation doesn't take hold. Uh, our voter rolls are being attacked, and we've been sued multiple times at the Secretary of State office on our voter rolls. And you know, luckily, we have a constitutional amendment that allows people to register on the same day of Election Day. So we need that at the federal level. Uh, but I'd also encourage anyone who's in another state where you don't have that same day voter registration ability to check your eligibility now. Check your eligibility ahead of the election time so that if there's an issue that you can proactively change it. In terms of certification, we have faced multiple issues across the state since 2020 where people have tried to use the certification process, the canvassing process to block the vote. And the way we've been able to, to fight that is that we've shined a light on those issues. So when we realize that there's about to be a problem in a county, we're alerted to it. Now in the Secretary of State's office, when I was with All Voting as Local, we were alerted to it in our uh, leadership in the advocacy space. And we shined, we shined a light on those problems because when people are actually confronted with what they're about to do and the implications mm -hmm. of it, they typically back down. So we have to stand strong because if we stand strong, people tend to, to wilt under pressure. Thank you so much. Uh, just one last thought to that question, and then we'll wrap and, and take any additional questions outside. Um, I agree with the three issues that you mentioned. I do think I, we work on election cybersecurity, among all these other things, and I think that was a big focus in 2020. And then there wasn't anything major, and we may have lost sight of that, but it remains a real issue and one thing that we did that was just a simple thing ahead of 2020 that we need to make sure we're saying to election officials now is do you have paper emergency backup ballots because if those systems crash mm -hmm. do you rerun the election that's it's quite difficult much better to just have emergency paper ballots so that in a state like Georgia where you don't have hand marked paper ballots as an option unless you're prepared people don't vote and that's right. unacceptable same with that's the right. poll books have emergency paper poll books for every precinct because if the poll books go down because somebody's messing with them, mm -hmm. you need people to be able to continue to vote. You want, don't want to be disenfranchising people with long lines. Nobody wants that. So the tech side, I think, is still important. We shouldn't lose sight of it. Just because it didn't happen doesn't mean that those systems aren't vulnerable um, to very obvious or less obvious issues. And I think having bipartisan conversations and making sure that we're building bridges to prevent violence is really important. Like Sam, I've been talking to a lot of Republicans who are scared and love our democracy and desperately want to find common ground. There are those people too. Pulling those folks to a team of pro-democracy violence interrupters, having those folks in bipartisan teams and women out front ready to respond when there is an issue at the poll, very clearly messaging that we stand for a peaceful democracy. <laughs> and we are now over time, so thank you all so much. Thank you to this incredible panel. Thank you all.